Welcome again to Spruce Up Your Website with expertise from StoryCorps. My name is Becky Wiegand and I'm an interactive events producer here at TechSoup Global. Today's expert joining us will be Dean Haddock who is the Senior Manager of Information Technology at StoryCorps. You'll also see Ali Bezdikian on the chat helping to answer your questions, help you with any technical issues, and capturing those questions for Q&A for later on in the presentation. Dean is going to walk us through the agenda when we get to his portion, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about TechSoup before we dive into the meat of the content for today. So who is TechSoup? We are part of TechSoup Global, and we are working toward the day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization on the planet has the technology, knowledge, and resources to operate at their full potential. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we serve organizations in more than 56 countries around the world with donations of technology products and resources, online tools like ReadyTalk, and installed software from companies like Microsoft, Adobe, Cisco, Symantec, all kinds of them. So if you are not familiar with our product donation program, feel free to visit TechSoup.org to learn how your nonprofit, library, charity, or foundation can access those donations. To get us started with the topic of the day in sprucing up your website, we want to understand a little bit more about where you are coming from. So a couple of quick polls. Did you design or build your own website, or did a third party build it? Go ahead and click on which answer most relates to your organization's situation with web building. So take just a moment. We'll give a little bit of time for everybody to chime in here. We have about 200 people on the line right now with us, so we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to weigh in. We have Sharon saying that a bit of both that sometimes you do in-house or third-party contractors. A few people don't have a website. I'm going to go ahead and skip to show the results. So about 40% designed and built their own website. 25% used third-party contractors. And about another 33% have done in-house. For those of you who don't have a website, we can probably share some resources today on how you can build one easily. One other quick poll question for you. How big is your web team, including designers? So for those of you who use a third party, this is the same answer essentially as the last one. But for the rest of you, we want to understand how many staff you are working with to help you build and manage your website. So just a few more seconds here. And this will help both me and Dean get a better understanding of your experience and your staff capabilities in-house. Let's see, we've gotten a couple of other comments. Christina says, it's part of what I do, but I don't do the website full-time. I imagine many people have that similar experience where it's one piece of a bigger job and not probably full-time, or it's maybe a couple of staff people's part-time work while they manage other tasks as well. It looks like 90 folks, 54% have one to two full-time staff, and 28% have all volunteer or no staff dedicated to that. So that's a pretty big chunk of people that don't have anybody or have two or fewer people doing it. So that should help give us some perspective on, on where you're at and what kind of expectations we have around how to do projects like sprucing up your website if you are doing a full web redesign, or building a brand new website for the first time, or if you are just able to do smaller tweaks. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our guest for today, Dean Haddock from StoryCorps, who we all know and love, StoryCorps and their terrific stories on NPR that make us weep while driving in the car on Friday mornings. <laughs> At least they do for me. Um, He's, he's going to give us his story of how StoryCorps recently went through their redesign of their website, as well as tips on how to improve your website even if you only have a little bit of time or a little bit of staff or a little bit of money, which we know all, all nonprofits are constantly dealing with those resource limitations. So I'm going to go ahead and say welcome, Dean, to the program. We're so glad to have you. Thanks, Becky. Uh, can you hear me okay? 
loud and clear. Okay, I'm going to – oh, great. Okay, so um, first I just want to uh, say thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, this is a really awesome opportunity to uh, connect with the community, and I can see already that a lot of people are chatting, and that's kind of what this whole thing is about. Um, thanks also to Charlene from ReadyTalk for helping us in the background. Um, Ali, Becky, and hello to Carlos, my good buddy who works there. Um, as Becky said, my name is Dean Haddock. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. That's where I'm coming uh, from today. Um, I'm originally from Denton, Texas, a very small town um, in North Texas near Dallas. Uh, I have a master's in political science, um, mainly focusing on institutional economics. I began working professionally in technology when I was about 15 and got into web uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, my experience includes legal, banking, aviation, telecommunications, academic, uh, media, and nonprofit. I ran a small online business in the academic publishing industry for about 10 years, and I'm now the head of a seven-person uh, technology team um, and an independent consultant in my free time. So that is who is Dean Haddock. Um, StoryCorps. Um, most, of, most people know us through our animations on YouTube or from our stories on NPR. Um, we record interviews with everyday people like you and me, archive them at the Library of Congress uh, permanently, and uh, broadcast them through channels like NPR, PBS, YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, uh, and more. So hopefully everybody has heard of us, and if you haven't, um, by all means, go check us out. Um, at StoryCorps.org, which is the website I am going to talk to you about uh, today. Um, just a couple more little things. Um, we have about 50,000 interviews um, and about 90,000 participants, um, comprising uh, over um, 18 to 20 terabytes of data, which is about three and a half years um, of audio if you were to listen to it end to end. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to kind of talk about what the Internet means to you. Um, I want to talk about how to design a website around goals and actions. Uh, I want to talk about your organization creating the right culture around the web, and then how to think a little bit beyond the web. So um, from our poll before, um, let's see if I can go back to it for just a second. Um, most people here designed and built their own site, which is cool. Um, I hope everybody finds this very interesting. We have a few people who don't have a website, so this will be good for them. Uh, it's much easier to start with um, a decent body of knowledge um, before you leap into an expensive web project, as I'm sure many people on this, uh, on this conference call right now have had that experience as well. Um, at StoryCorps, uh, we have uh, three to five people working on the web at any given time. Um, so that's our situation. And um, the seven-person team that uh, I manage includes myself and includes a couple of interns uh, and uh, a brilliant um, data uh, system, information systems coordinator, um, help desk, uh, tech support staff, and um, you know, our web team. So, what we're going to talk about today is how we go from this, which is our site. Um, you can visit it on the Internet Archive. Just go to the Wayback Machine and uh, search for StoryCorps, and you can see kind of the evolution of the site over time. It's a really good um, experiment uh, for any website that you love. Um, but one thing, you'll not well, one thing you'll notice on this site is there's a lot of information. Uh, there are probably about 36 different things that you could click on on this page. And the stories that most people um, know us from aren't front and center. Um, this is where our featured story lived. There's no animation. Uh, you would have to get to our animations by going over here to animated shorts. So uh, a lot of this was designed by committee, and the website sort of evolved from something very simple to um, kind of a, almost a Wikipedia uh, entry reflecting um, you know, the different departments and functions of our organization, which um, makes sense, but um, it wasn't suiting us. And it's 10th anniversary, so why not do a little redesign? Uh, 
And this is where we ended up today. Um, I took this screenshot yesterday. Here is the page where you used to listen to um, audio. This is what it looks like today. Um, notice here um, you can browse by category and search. Um, you can get some more stories. This carousel um, hid two of the three stories, um, but you, know, you, you could get other ones. We had two, two carousels on there originally. Um, but this has a continuous scroll, so it loads with Ajax. And you have a couple of different ways to browse it, um, which I encourage you to go um, play with. So it was easy, right? Easy as a fee. Um, not quite. Um, but we did use uh, <laughs> the golden mean a little bit in designing uh, some, of the, some of the home pages. This is beyond uh, anyone. Just um, look up the golden ratio and design, and you can find some very interesting principles about how to lay out a page. We're not going to go into any detail on that. That would be a whole uh, web, webinar of its own. Um, so the first question that anybody should start with um, when, they're, when they're looking at um, designing a website is you think about what does it mean to you. Um, for me, uh, it's a global brain, and that's how I conceptualize it. Um, I uh, basically I see the a website as a reference point and a way to send and receive information from one part of that global brain to another. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because um, uh, you know the well. Let's <laughs> let's not get into that too much. Sorry, um, I'll get a little too philo philosophical for it. Um, the, uh, my friends, though, and my family, uh, they see the Internet as a way to connect, a way to look at cute cat pictures and um, you know, tag each other in photos and things like that. And to some people, um, you know, a lot of uh, people that ultimately people we have to work with and people that we have to consider in our designs and a lot of our audience, um, you know, they might conceptualize as, of the Internet as simply email. Um, the point here is that everyone has a different relationship to the web. Um, and to me, that's influenced by a lot of different things. Um, someone's socioeconomic background, their gender, their income, um, their profession, what they're into, where they live, you know, if there's access to broadband. Um, there are a lot of different factors. And really, I mean, they're, they're infinite. And so you're designing one you know, static point or, or place for all these people to come together. So how do we make a website that people like? Um, the answer is simple. You know, we have designed it around them and not us. And this is a, a place where I think a lot of um, organizations uh, trip themselves up is because they are designing a website around um, themselves and reflecting the things that they think are important, um, and not necessarily reflecting things that the audience um, or the visitors think are important. And what's important to them may be what's important to you, and that's great, um, and it may not be. Um, you know, we get a lot of traffic, for instance, to our great questions list. Um, in fact, if you search for great questions, uh, on Google, I think, uh, we used to show up as number one. We probably still do. Um, and that's, you know, that's for people who are looking for interview questions with family. Those are people who may not even be interested in StoryCorps, but they see our, our questions as a great resource. Um, you know, so we take, we take a lot of care on that page, even though it's not technically you know, someone recording an interview or anything like that. Um, we actually have the great questions up there. Uh, just to be clear, um, for people to prepare uh, for a StoryCorps interview. Um, let's see. So who is your audience? Um, when we set out to design our site, we broke down our audience into five basically different types of people. And who it is for us is not um, who it's going to be for you necessarily. Um, it may be, um, but for us, these, the, these different types included uh, concepts like a newbie, you know, someone who's never heard of StoryCorps before or maybe just heard about us on the radio. 
um, we have, um, you know, we think of our supporters as a community. We think of our participants um, and uh, people wanting to make an interview. We think of our funders, uh, like foundations and um, you know, different granting institutions. Um, and by dividing our audience this way, and, and we actually give these people names. We like think of an archetype of this person, and it's a very healthy exercise. Um, to kind of talk about, okay, well, here's, here's this person. His name's James, and he just heard us on the radio uh, on NPR and uh, checks out our site. So what kind of computer does James have? Um, you know, is he accessing our site at work or is he accessing at, at home? When you, when you think of your visitors and you think of, you think of them as their story, um, as as a human being and not just a click, um, creating that kind of compassion uh, with your visitor I think is key in creating you know, a good website. So once we broke down uh, our visitors into these groups, and of course some of them are probably going to be a little bit off, and this is a, a constantly evolving process. A website is no static document. It's a, it's a constantly changing, constantly moving document. Um, so we took these groups, and then uh, we gave them distinct goals. Uh, now, this is actually pretty complicated um, despite the, the graphic here, but um, you know, each of these five people, we want to complete um, one of these five goals in time. And some of them, we want, uh, we want them to complete the goals um, you know, more than once. So you know, obviously, headphones represent listening. Uh, the second one is storytelling. Three was like just to like us and support us. Uh, we want them to uh, also connect with us and form partnerships. And this may be a good opportunity to tell you guys that um, uh, we, we not only have uh, the broadcast on NPR, I'll back up just a little bit. Um, we have uh, a door-to-door -door type of service where uh, if you want us to come into your organization and record stories with you, um, we do that. And we do that with hundreds of organizations um, a year. So um, right here actually is where we ended up putting that on the website. Um, the reason I'm telling you that though is because that audience and forming a partnership with us is a very high priority goal of the organization it's one of the ways that we're able to record thousands and thousands of interviews um, per year and get our word out and also help organizations um, tell their own stories. Um, uh, but that, that's one distinct goal, but that's a very different goal than uh, listening to one of our clips. And moreover, um, how we present that on the web uh, you know, should fit in hierarchically with where it is as a priority of our organization. And this is where it actually gets very complicated um, because if we, um, if we kind of like take a step back, um, one of the biggest challenges with designing a website isn't necessarily the technology um, of designing the site itself or using uh, WordPress or, or using Drupal, uh, a content management system, or whether you do it by hand. Um, those things are technically difficult, but um, how your organization sees uh, the website and how you prioritize around the organization's goals, um, which is going to be different for every organization, uh, but that, that's challenging and that involves, um, you know, it, it involves a lot of conversations. So let me go back to this slide. Um, I just want to show you kind of how the different goals are reflected on here. So if you remember the original uh, version of the site, um, you know, the, uh, the latest broadcast was over here. And now it's front and center with a slider. So you can go back and forth and hear several stories. We also have more stories down here. So on the original version of our home page, uh, you had to click on listen to the story, and then it would take you to another page, and that's where you listen. Um, we built our own player, and uh, that's now uh, embedded several times on one page, and you can 
hear featured and popular stories. Um, we also added a map to tell people about uh, you know, where they can record their interviews. And uh, we now have a featured place for our blog. So totally different approach. Social media here, everything designed around the end user, making it very simple for them. And I would still say you know, we could reduce clutter probably you know, 20 more percent. And we probably will over time because I, as, I, as I said, a, a website is not something that, that's ever complete. Oh, and let me add as well, when you scroll down the site, uh, the menu stays on top, and we now have a, a much more powerful uh, search feature. None of that was on the home page before. Um, we also made several different ways to discover content. So instead of just uh, experiencing stuff in a linear way as it's broadcast, we have over 500 stories on our site. Um, and so we wanted to make, people, make it easy for people to find it in a way that, that was fun. Uh, we also, you know, in, there's this saying of like eating one's own cooking or eating one's own dog food. And we really did kind of design the site as well with like, well, how do we want to experience the stories? Because there are people in our organization that match very closely to um, a lot of people in our audience. And we have a very, very diverse um, group of, of employees. There are about 100 of us. Um, across the country, and we're diverse across you know, so many dimensions. Um, if we could make something that we liked, uh, we thought that maybe other people would like it too. So one of the funny things about this, over here we have a grid view and a list view, and some people really like seeing the list of the stories, and some people like seeing the grid. So we thought, well, hey, why don't we um, make it easy for people to do both of those things. So um, Jean, this just is to now interrupt really quickly. Yep. Sorry, just to interrupt really quickly. We had a question from Minnie that's related to these slides that asks, are the goals that you set, are those our goals as an organization or the goal of the audience when they come to the site? So when you're setting those goals and talking about your audience, are you setting the goals for what you want your audience to do, or are the goals based on what the audience wants to do? Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, totally. Um, well, and, and really, um, it's both. Um, the, you know, if, if this were a for-profit organization, um, it might be a little bit easier um, you know, to, to explain, well, we want to sell widgets, and we want to present them to people who are looking for widgets, and we, we want to connect the, the buyer and the seller for that experience. Um, here, we really just want people to enjoy our content, and it's part of our mission um, to, to celebrate listening and celebrate and honor each other's lives um, that, that we want to present the content. So it's a goal for us to have as many shares and listens and, and that kind of quantitative metric. Um, we also want people to have a qualitative experience. Um, and the goal from the user perspective or from the visitor perspective is um, to have some engaging content. And then many people like to connect and share these stories um, and relate to their friends with them. Uh, so it's a little bit of both. And the trick is to, or it's not really a trick, I guess the, the, you know, the, in my opinion, in my experience, the best way to approach that is in a way that um, uh, ultimately focuses on the visitor because if, they, if there's no visitor, what's the point in having a website? So um, ultimately, I guess the easy way to look at that question is, it, is it's really both, and you have to understand both. Most people, I think most, most organizations, many organizations rather, I'll say, focus probably more on their own goals. Um, which is why we have so many uh, questionable websites out there. Um, contacting us, for instance, um, you know, this uh, used to be we had uh, several pages you had to click three or four times in order to get to a contact form uh, or a phone number or an email address. And so now when you click Contact Us, you go straight to Contact Us. Um, so for those people who are trying to get in touch with us, 
uh, we made it simpler for them to accomplish that goal. So contacting us would be an example of a goal, and um, we made it much simpler. So I'll talk about that next. So I want to talk a little bit about <laughs> core concepts. Um, very simple. Uh, remove unnecessary barriers to actions for any visitor type. So um, I mentioned with the contact us goal, we had three different steps and a lot of text that people had to read to know how to contact us. Um, we assume now that people already know how to use a form, for instance, and uh, that when they're ready to contact us, they've already you know, done their homework or they have a question or they want to get in touch with us very easily. Um, and then we want to streamline and simplify the actions people want to take. So um, for example, when people come to StoryCorps.org, uh, we assume uh, that, and maybe we're wrong about this, but um, you know, we have to test. Uh, we assume that people want to listen to the content or they want to hear stories. Um, or they want to get in touch with us, or they want to support us, um, we made it easier. And every one of our goals and for every one of our user groups uh, or visitor types, we tried to remove the barriers to anything they wanted to do or that we could help them do, like listen to one of our stories. Uh, and then we simplified it. So big play button starts playing right there, for instance. Um, and the reason we did this uh, is because the research suggests there, there is a little bit of literature on this uh, that you must communicate your value in under 10 seconds and that most people aren't going to uh, read. So this graph here shows the probability of somebody leaving uh, the page. Um, it uh, increases rapidly um, after just a few seconds. And again, the the source of this article is here, so um, if you get the slide deck uh, after this talk, you'll be able to go back and, and check out some of these resources. Um, the question to ask ourselves is, you know, what, what does the visitor expect to see? Um, they need to have a large uh, probability of being correct when they click a link uh, in their expectations of what they're going to see on the other side. So, for instance, you're not going to get a lot of click-through if on the other side of your Contact Us link um, you have a bunch of text uh, that's explaining to you a lot of things. You expect to see a form. You expect to see a phone number or an email address. Um, let's see. So these are just kind of, kind of some concepts of uh, site design and designing around user goals. and designing around um, kind of archetypes for your visitor, uh, which you know, if you run um, a theater or a ballet company or you're at a library, um, you, can, you can think, think about your visitors. Look back at your, um, your email list if you have an email list. Or I mean, I'm sure most every organization has some kind of uh, contact list for their community. Um, and go out there and talk to them. Ask them questions. Ask them what they like. What is it that you like about our website? Um, what is it that you wish we did that we don't do? Um, you can also put a survey up on your website, which we'll be doing uh, very shortly uh, as well. So design around them. Provide for them what you can provide. Um, and all this kind of boils down to uh, the culture uh, of your website. And I, you know, when I started at StoryCorps five years ago, um, our culture was very different around the web. Uh, people would send in requests to a web developer who would, um, you know, sort of like crunch those requests and implement whatever was asked. But there was no central philosophy around the site. I mean, there there was a little bit. There were. Um, you know, there were some obvious things like we knew we were going to have our broadcast on there. We knew that we were going to have a link to our podcast and these sorts of things. But programs and initiatives, um, we have a, uh, an array of programs um, you know, to, to record the voices um, of the country and uh, also an array of initiatives. So uh, we serve um, you know, various different populations. Last year, 
Uh, we, we launched a Military Voices Initiative, for instance, which um, serves um, uh, veterans and their families. Um, and so uh, when we would launch one of these new initiatives or programs, the way it was described would evolve from one to another. And so, uh, but there was no uh, coalescing sort of theme or uh, approach to the web that really said, hey, um, this needs to be uniform and it needs to be simple and clear um, for the most uh, possible people, um, which is what we really try to do uh, in the redesign. And we'll continue to try to do it. Um, now, our culture is a little bit different, um, but still a little bit the same. Uh, we do still you know, uh, fulfill requests from different departments, um, but we have, in the course of the last couple of years, uh, sat down together, um, had project teams working on discrete components of the site, and having conversations across departmental boundaries and across silos um, to kind of uh, get everyone on the same page of understanding of like, um, you know, what's important for your program or for your department. Okay, cool. Well, here's how it fits in with what we're trying to do over here for this department. And IT's role um, is not just to take a, uh, you know, a piece of paper mock-up from uh, our communications department and crunch uh, the site and program it. Um, what we do is we also play a central role in how people talk about and, and relate to our website. So we bring people to the table. We have uh, interdepartmental meetings. Um, and, and there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of Q&A. Uh, we call this the consultant mentality. And I, I hope that everyone out there with the web department um, you know, has the type of web department uh, and has the type of technological in infrastructure um, built around service because ultimately this is a service function of the organization. And I always encourage my staff to, to operate in such a way uh, as if they are an independent consultant working with a department or working with the organization to try to solve a problem. And that mentality, I think that mindset, um, makes for the best uh, communication. Because the other thing, I mean, the big elephant in the room is a lot of us, um, I mean, the, design, graphic design and, and web design can be a very emotional thing for people. And um, people uh, tend to um, you know, get attached to certain design elements. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we talked about how everyone has a different relationship to the web. Well, somebody who only sends email um, might be uh, the head of your organization or the head of uh, you know, the division where your web design sits, and they say, oh, well, I want the weather on the home page because everybody wants the weather, and that's, gonna, you know, that's how I, you know, I attended a, an SEO talk, and um, someone said put the weather on the site. And, and you can't, uh, if you push back on that, um, emotionally or you're unclear in how you communicate to that person why it may or may not be the best idea ever. I mean, it could be. It could be a great idea. Um, but how, how you communicate with that person, if you don't have compassion from where they're coming from, you know, if um, they lived in a remote village somewhere with no broadband access until three months ago, um, then the way that they see the web is going to be very different than somebody who's been building websites since they were 18. Being able to communicate with all these different people and at all levels of the organization is critical, especially for a web team, because there's a lot of faith that, and trust that people have to put in, into, your, into your work. Um, so we, I talked a little bit about how we meet together. Um, we create project teams. So like we have a web project team where our marketing communications and, and, um, and even bring in other people from time to time uh, where we meet. Um, called buy-in. 
And the neat thing about project teams is that they create automatic buy-in. So I would recommend, you know, if you have a large organization with many departments, having a liaison from each one of those departments, um, you know, work together and kind of form like a congress of, well, um, you know, have those people help you figure out the story of your audience and give you anecdotes um, from, from those communities and the people that they serve. Then when they're communicating back to their department, um, everybody is on the same page. Um, and without this, without buy-in, your web project's uh, not going to make it. I mean, it's, it may make it. I mean, it, uh, it sometimes by brute force, um, a website uh, will get through, but you know, I, people I think you know, you know, have career-ending confrontations during this process sometimes. And um, with buy-in and and establishing clear communication channels, uh, one is much uh, more likely to succeed. Uh, and who do you pick for your uh, your project team? Uh, anyone and everyone. Um, don't just pick the savvy person who uses Twitter. Pick someone who um, you know, has an old Motorola flip phone. Um, pick someone who is really savvy with the web. <clears throat> Diversity. Um, and we call this keeping everyone on the bus in my department. Uh, so um, one little tip. I know that we're I think we're okay on time, but we're, we're getting a little close. So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Um, one needs to consider front of house and back of house when they're designing and conceptualizing their website as well. Um, you know, we have, as I mentioned, 100 people at the organization and uh, you know, a substantial amount of uh, web traffic and people trying to get in touch with us. Um, so <clears throat> in that process of making it easier for uh, our visitors to do what they came to the website to do, um, we had to also think about how that was going to appear on the other side of the screen. So when an email came through, when 50 emails came through, um, how are we going to manage that? And, and so we use a, a, a customer relationship management tool on the back end um, that connects. But uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. The, the important point is here that when we uh, built the website, we also were communicating with these different departments of like, okay, well, this, uh, you know, this form is going to come in. You're going to have these important key data points which are important to you. Uh, they gave us the information, and we, we built uh, the system around their specifications. But, uh, the idea was though that it was a holistic approach to building the website and not just thinking of like a, a home page redesign. <clears throat> so lastly, uh, last little topic here is um, you know, beyond the website. And we've talked a lot in this, uh, or I've talked a lot, um, and I hope you're getting something out of it out there. But, um, We've talked about what people do on your website, but really the way to see a website, we've talked about front and back of house too, but even beyond that is how people find your website. And uh, that, is, that, that may be or may not be um, you know, because they heard you on the radio or one of their friends recommended uh, your service or your product, um, but it may be from searching and optimization or seeing a tweet and seeing uh, Facebook, and we have to think about the way that um, people enter your site. So uh, this is sometimes very simple, um, things like uh, you know, making sure your open graph tags are set, set up correctly so that you know, when somebody posts uh, one of your blog entries or a link to your website on Facebook, it shows up well. Um, it could also be a little bit more complex, like um, you know, Google AdSense or um, you know, a, even a QR code or something like that. So the simple formula for, um, I would say, generating 
web traffic, or at least um, a popular philosophy uh, right now is that you, you first have this brand awareness hurdle to get over. So people have to hear about you. And the marketing wizards will tell you that they need to hear you probably five or six times before you register in their consciousness. Um, and then there, there has to be an affinity that emerges around your brand. So first I become aware of your brand and your product or your service. And then um, I decide whether it's for me or whether it will serve me or whether I want to wear that T-shirt or listen to that type of music or you know, um, whether I relate to it. And then once I relate to it, I begin relating to your organization. And at that point, I may start also relating with other people and creating uh, a community around your brand. And I have my friends who like your good or your service and we talk about your good or your service, or we talk about what your good or your service is doing, what your organization is up to, what kind of scandal you're in, um, or uh, what grant you received, or what great project you're doing. And social media is that, that medium uh, where all of that takes place. And so, um, Everyone knows that you should have a Facebook button if you have a Facebook page. But more than that, um, you must encourage people also to take, take the action of sharing and conversing around something. You need to let them know that they have that opportunity and make it very easy for them. And that's ultimately how to make your website a place where people congregate. And one of the very interesting things um, about StoryCorps is that our, what we produce, the broadcast clip, is um, a really great digestible piece of media um, to go on social networks. Um, you know, it's not a big ask for you know, an hour-long engagement um, with a visitor to listen to one of our clips. It's three to five minutes usually, and uh, you can listen to as many as you want. I think our podcast runs you know, five to ten minutes currently, um, although that, that may change in the future. Um, you know, we, uh, we not only think about how the uh, content appears on the website when people go there after, you know, hearing our clip or just because it's Friday and they want to see what the latest broadcast is, um, we uh, also think about that there's a player in Facebook and we want to make it look good. And we know that a, a lot of people like to listen to us on SoundCloud. Um, and we, we think about these sorts of things uh, as well and make sure that people can experience our content in the context that they want to experience it in um, and without losing touch, of them, uh, touch with them as well. So they're always one click away back to our website, two, to, two clicks away from contacting us, um, and for donating, supporting our mission, um, for sharing our content, etc. Um, so conclusions, um, just really quickly, design around your visitors, not your organization. Make it easy for them. Um, create a culture around this experience and bring people to the table. Um, it creates buy-in. Um, so everybody feels like they have a sense of ownership in the project. And you're going to get better ideas because seriously, some of the best ideas about your website that you'll get will come from people that know the least about the Internet. And um, some of the needs of your audience, one person cannot possibly think about. Um, you know, someone needs to raise their hand and say, oh, you know, my cousin um, is blind. And how is he or she going to experience this site? Um, it's, it's critical. Um, also then visualizing your website, your presence, excuse me, your online presence beyond just your website, and taking a holistic approach um, to your design uh, and, and implementation. Um, last, I always just tell people to be patient um, and to let their ego go about the website because the website is not about um, the developer, it's not about the designer. 
Uh, it's about the mission of the organization, and it's about the community that you serve, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. Um, and you know, setting up a deadline for a website, I think, is is you know uh, sometimes a, a a bad decision. I mean, you want to have a launch date, and that's important for certain milestones, obviously. Um, but never think of your website as complete. Don't say that ah the website is finished on September 1st. Say that the website is in its new form is just beginning, um, because when you change over to a website, you're really, you're really just at that point of starting. You're not finished with anything. Um, I mean, maybe there are some designers out there who really nail it, or there are products or services or concepts that are so simple that you know, things really are complete. Um, but for most organizations, I find that isn't the case. And, and organizations themselves are also very dynamic things. So, um, Thanks very much. I uh, hope I gave us enough time for some questions. I saw there were a lot of them, and uh, you know this is my first webinar, so uh, you know I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks so much uh, to everyone for being here and for uh, li listening to me. Thanks so much, Dean. Terrific presentation, and we do have quite a few questions from people. So I'll jump right in. With um, Suzanne asked, what CMS did you use for the StoryCorps site, or did you build it yourself? Uh, yes, we use WordPress. Um, okay. You know, I try to be technologically agnostic, um, but uh, I will tell you that there's not one thing that we've needed to do uh, with, Word with WordPress that we weren't able to do. And we have some pretty sophisticated things going on. I've also built a handful of WordPress sites for a lot of other organizations. The advantage here is you're not going to be locked in to a developer or a, um, a particular, um, how would you say this? Uh, a particular design. Um, yeah. Uh, you can, um, excuse me. You can. Uh, hold on, I got I got a little interruption in my phone there. Um, if you need to change developers, you can put an ad on Craigslist, and you'll get 50 responses, you know, in a couple of days because a lot of people know WordPress. Um, you can also um, uh, have staff who are not experts with HTML or the web update your site. So CMS is a great way to go. WordPress is fantastic, and, and you won't be dependent upon anyone or any technology with that approach. I would agree with that. We've, I've built WordPress websites as well for, for prior organizations. And some people had asked about tools in general, and some others that were mentioned by commenters were Weebly, Homestead, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla. So we can, we can include links to some of those as tools. Some are more complicated than others, and we have articles on our website, on TechSoup's website, that compare some of those tools. Um, so if you're looking for a CMS to use or content management system, that's what CMS stands for, um, those are some good options, and I would second that I think WordPress is a really great option, particularly if you don't have much in-house staff um, because it's something that you can sort of out of the box pick a template and have a website within a couple of hours, even if it's a really basic, simple website. Um, we have some questions, quite a few questions from people about how to work with your internal staff, how to get that buy-in. Um, like Wendy asks, in our organization, most of the departments don't care about the website, have never even been to it, so they don't care what's on it and don't contribute to the ideas for the site when it's pages, even when it's pages that pertain to their department. I've tried to get them involved and take ownership, but I'm always met with no interest. How can I engage them? Any um, ideas for her? Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, will you will you run that by me again? Sure. Like that, she's just met with teams uh, in her organization and departments that really don't care about the website, and they don't see how it's useful for them. So, how do you engage mm -hmm. them in the process of making the site better for the people ah. that they serve? <laughs> uh, do something really, really bad with the site, and then see if they care. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Don't do that at all. Um, you know. Ask them what they're into. I mean, are they people who don't use the Internet at all? I would be very surprised if that were the case. Um, it's very, very similar um, to sales. 
um, get to know your customer. And then um, maybe they say, you know, I'm just not interested because, um, you know, because I have more things to do or because I hate design or, you know, it, it's boring or too complicated. Um, one of my there coworkers ways. just chimed in saying, offer them snacks, which I think is funny, but can yeah. actually work. Get people to show up to the meeting. <laughs> that's, that's good. Me. And then I would also say, if, if someone is not interested in it, do they, do they need to be? And is it okay to just let them be not interested in it? Um, the, uh, there's a saying we have in Texas, don't try to teach a pig to sing. Uh, you won't like the results, <laughs> and you'll just annoy the pig. So. Um, that's a good point. So when you spend that time to define your audience, also spending the time to define who the real stakeholders internally need to be, whether that's other, a staff person from another team, or the ED, or people on the board, or your volunteers, um, that's a good process of defining. And if you find that resistance, I would say maybe look for somebody else that might have a, a similar perspective that is willing to participate. Um, mm -hmm. Sandy asks, our org has a stark line between web developers, the tech folks, and content creators, mostly non-tech. Oh. Any suggestions on how to erase that line um, because there's such this, this divide between the tech and the content folks and a big learning curve for time strapped staff? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Um, well, it's always good to have overlap in departments. Um, so cross-training people as a necessity for continuation of business um, or some kind of, you know, if one of the departments, you know, has to work on some big project for like uh, six months, is there no content created for your site or is there a way to cross-train the other departments um, for the purposes of, hey, this is important. Um, we need to make sure that we have some overlap on processes here in case anybody leaves or you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, I find that can bring people together and is also a great opportunity um, to, to kind of uh, create some compassion and empathy for the people that we have to um, work with. Um, so overlap I think is important. Another approach I've heard recently that one of, our, one of my colleagues, his organization does is they have um, a project manager that specifically liaises with the different departments for a uh, for a, a discrete project. And if the organization, um, if Sandy's organization has the resources, um, having an external project manager can help can help the organization bridge, bridge those lines. It's not necessary. It's not necessarily the goal to change the people. But if we can create a structure that can work despite the people, um, then um, that's another approach as well. Because you know, people I, I find tend to change when they want to and when they're motivated to, um, not just because there's an outside pressure uh, put on them. That can actually make things go a little bit worse. Great. Um, we have a question from Sarah asking, you know, we want our website to be helpful to people who want our services and also to people who want to provide their services. Is this too much in one website? And kind of related to that, there was a question asking, how many audiences, like is there a number that you should be defining? Like is, you know, if you say we've got six audiences we want to serve with our website, is that too much? Or you know, is there a sweet spot, like really targeting these mm. three groups of people? Um, what do you think is the right right spot for that? And is it too much to ask that the website can support the people who want the services as well as people who want to provide them? Um, no, I mean, the, the, let me answer the easy one first, which is there's no sweet number um, or magical number for it. Um, you know, I find it's easy to conceptualize things, uh, at least in my brain, um, in groups of like three or five. I think after that, um, you know, it starts getting a little bit complex. I think you need more than one, probably not 10 or 20. Um, but the way to look at that is to kind of see which are the biggest ones. And you know, obviously, if part of your audience is only 2% uh, and another part 
you know, makes up 98%, then you'd probably want to focus on, on the, the larger chunk. Um, the other question about um, services, um, getting your services versus selling my own services. Um, without knowing more specific details, I totally encourage you to send me an email and I'll, I'll look at the site. I also consult um, on the outside and moreover just love to talk to people about what they're doing and hear, hear about what they're doing. Um, but without knowing the specifics, it's hard for me to say. But I will say that the beautiful thing about the Internet is that it's, it's such a dynamic and fluid medium. And I would say there is a way, um, one way or another, to accomplish both of those goals if that's what your organization does. Um, and there's a way to communicate it to the audience uh, clearly and easily. And you may have to try 10 different times before you nail it, but each time you change, you'll do something a little bit better. And so it's probably more important to keep moving uh, on that goal than to overthink it. Um, and then I would just say, ask people. Put an extra question on a contact form uh, or you know, ask them what they think of your website or what could make it easier. Um, they might end up doing all the work for you. Great. We are just about out of time, so I'm just going to ask a technology-related question. Um, so Bill asked sort of what the technology is behind the website. You mentioned that it was um, WordPress, but is there a specific programming <laughs> language that you'd recommend for creating your site? Um, anything that speaks a little bit to the technology that you're working with? Yes. Um, and I'll tell you that before working at a nonprofit, I worked in a, in a bank and financial institution consulting agency and, uh, or consulting firm really. And um, it was all Microsoft and closed source, .NET. Um, I also did mostly server building and administration network management, uh, more technical uh, back of house stuff. Um, in, at StoryCorps, uh, we use a lot of open source work. So um, WordPress is built on PHP, um, and we use a lot of JavaScript and jQuery. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail um, beyond that, um, but I will say that um, you know, we're fortunate enough to have um, some really, really sharp uh, coders and developers. We also uh, work with interns and help them learn uh, these technologies. So like, um, you know, I've, I've given a class to my staff that went over the course of like three months um, with maybe like six different lessons about MySQL, um, for instance. So um, we not only um, look for expertise out in the field to help us, but we, we will also train internally. Um, but JavaScript, PHP, open source, and the advantage to that is open source is, commu is uh, community supported. So we're not dependent upon the whims of um, one corporation, um, but actually the culture or the movement of um, an open source community. So it's, it's, to me it's a little bit more like building a house on uh, stone um, you know, versus, versus sand. Um, I think we all know as well, like love or hate Google, Facebook, etc. Um, both of those uh, sites, both of those services really change unilaterally. They don't ask us what we want, or maybe they have focus groups, but every time you log into your Facebook account, something is different, and the same with Gmail. Um, Great. So, so we, we don't want to subject ourselves to the same thing when it comes to like a, a web technology. Terrific. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so I just want to thank you for your time. And sorry for folks, we didn't get to answer all the questions. Um, there was one question about accessible technologies for visually impaired, and I'll include a link in the follow-up email that links to one of our prior webinars that's just about accessible web technologies um, for that one. But thank you so much, Dean, for this great resource that you've given us. And for everybody listening, you'll receive this webinar and all the resources discussed, including links to the sites like WordPress and Drupal, or <laughs> Drupal and Joomla and Weebly and all the different tools that we've mentioned today in that follow-up email shortly after uh, this afternoon. So keep an eye out for that. 
And I'd like to thank Ali on the back end for helping to field questions. And again, thank you so much, Dean and StoryCorps, for your participation in today's event. Your new website looks great. So hopefully we can take some of these uh, tips and strategies that you've shared with us to go back and improve our own websites. Lastly, I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, that makes their platform for offering web conferences like this available to us so that we can offer webinars to you on a weekly basis. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific afternoon. We hope you'll join us again soon. Bye-bye.